Welcome back to part two of nephron physiology and urine formation. Let's start with a green highlighter and color in the thin descending limb. of the loop of Henley and uh, I guess we'll just go ahead and do the the thick ascending limb too in green my green highlighter here is just about giving up the ghost okay so now this is this whole thing is called um, the loop of Henley named after the anatomist that described described it. Um, this part going down right here is called the thin descending limb. And what happens here is simple osmosis where water follows all of those solutes out of the tube and into the blood because a whole bunch of solutes have returned to the blood in the proximal convoluted tubule and in the thin loop of Henley, Henley the water follow, follows the solutes that were reabsorbed in the PCT. Uh, as this happens, the filtrate becomes more concentrated. And the longer this loop is, the more concentration can occur. this is kind of cool because different kinds of animals have different uh, lengths uh, relatively to their size of their loops of Henley. So for example, humans were, you know, all right at concentrating our urine. So we have some short loops of Henley and some long loops of Henley. And then some animals are extremely good at concentrating their urine. And things in that category would be like uh, the kangaroo rat which can concentrate its urine so much that I've heard that it doesn't even need to drink water. It gets all the water that it needs from the foods that it eats because it basically reabsorbs all of its water. Uh, pretty amazing. Okay, so then the thin ascending limb, sorry, the thin ascending limb right here, or did I call it say thin? Sorry, thick. The thick when I see that thickness to it, it tells me it's doing a lot of active transport. And sure enough, it has lots of pumps. Those require ATP for active sodium reabsorption. So we're talking about water reabsorption on this side and salt reabsorption on this side. Uh oh, did we get blurry? And if we're going to talk about reabsorption, let's put some more paratubular capillaries there. The paratubular capillaries kind of straighten out along with the loop of Henle, so they're called the vas erecta in this portion of the loop. And they come up like that. So I'd like to use, um, let's see, maybe a black pen for everywhere that water is going out. So look, remember water was able to be reabsorbed into these capillaries um, here, most of it was, and then it's going out, 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 all the way down the thin descending limb. Then use a blue pen to show now what's going out on in the thick ascending limb is salt, not water. 
So the blood is getting saltier at this point. So sodium is going out. And in fact, these cells are impermeable to water, so water's not even allowed to follow yet. But it will get its chance. Its chance is coming. Oh man, sorry. Focusing problems in this video. Let's see if I move the paper a little bit. Is that better? Okay, so the distal convoluted tubule comes next. And that will be in purple. So remember it's called distal because its segment is much farther from the Bowman's capsule than the proximal. It's called convoluted because it's twisty, twisty and of course it's another part of the tubule. Uh, the distal convoluted tubule, I have to say, is probably my favorite part of the nephron. It has this really cool job in that it's very sensitive to a hormone that you've learned of that's called aldosterone. And what aldosterone does is causes reabsorption of more sodium. So let's go ahead and use our blue pen to show, oh, first we have to put the blood vessels on. So we go, woo, boom, woo, boom, woo, boom. Okay, so in the distal convoluted tubule, under the influence of aldosterone, sodium is returned to the blood. And what can then happen is, is that eventually we're going to open the floodgates and let water go back into the blood to, um, at, according to osmosis. All the sodium that left here makes water want to go back to the blood. All the sodium that left here makes water go back, want to go back to the blood. So depending on how much aldosterone is present, you can have more or less sodium return to the blood. And it really just depends on how dehydrated you are. If you're very dehydrated, your body will secrete more aldosterone, which will cause more sodium to go back to the blood, which will cause more water eventually to go back to the blood, which will help maintain the blood in your body so that you can keep your blood pressure adequate even when you're dehydrated. Um, in other situations though, let's say you drink tons and tons of water all the time, you might not need to release much aldosterone from your adrenal cortex because the salt that comes out here is plenty and you can just let that sodium stay in the tubule and have more sodium lost in your urine. It all is based on your body's need for sodium at that time. But then the most elegant part of this is in the collecting duct. which will color blue. This is the last gasp at concentrating the urine. So let's go ahead and put the paratubular capillaries around there. And this is called the collecting duct. Wait, actually let's write about it down here because I have more. I need to put some other stuff in that spot. So the collecting duct um, allows reabsorption of water under the influence of another hormone you've learned about called antidiuretic hormone or ADH. What's cool about this hormone is that it causes 
um, what are called aquaporins to be inserted to the collecting duct membrane, and that is what, how the water um, is able to be reabsorbed to the blood. We always have a little bit of ADH, um, and it allows most of the water to um, be reabsorbed. Uh, we can concentrate our urine to a maximum of about a liter a day, and that would be with maximal, or sorry, half a liter a day would be maximal, and that would be with lots and lots of um, ADH. But if we didn't have any, which does sometimes happen to some people with certain kinds of pituitary problems, their pituitary gland doesn't release any antidiuretic hormone, and they will actually urinate up to 25 liters a day, and they'll have a problem known as diabetes insipidus. So let's put that down here. And that shows you how important ADH is. This word, um, well, diabetes means lots of urine, basically, and insipid means bland or tasteless urine. And in ancient times, they would sometimes taste the urine of someone that had um, that was had too much urine, and they would find out was it sweet? That meant they had diabetes mellitus, or was it bland? That meant they had diabetes insipidus. Okay, so remember we used the black pen for water coming out, so we'll do that here too. So this is where the water has its final chance for reabsorption. And then any water that comes out the bottom of the collecting duct will be headed for the, uh, is considered urine, and it goes down the ureter, and then from there to the bladder, and then exits the body via the urethra. So now let's focus on some sensitive measures that are um, that something called the juxtaglomerular apparatus has in controlling the filtration of fluids. This JGA is what I'll call it and let's see I used red, orange, yellow, green, Boy, I used all my colors today. I guess we'll just use a black right here. And in this area right here, there are specialized cells where the DCT actually touches Bowman's capsule. Kind of do it like that. And we call it the JGA, which stands for um, juxta, that means next to something, glomerular, that means it's next to the glomerular capillary bed apparatus. So it's this structure that seems to be very good at sensing low blood volume or blow, low blood pressure. Sometimes they're even said it can sense low oxygen, but I'll just leave it at low blood volume. And if it senses low blood volume, then it causes the release of two important um, substances. The first one is renin. Renin just means kidney. And renin will ultimately trigger the formation of angiotensin 2, which will ultimately increase blood pressure. And we have a different page where we'll really talk about that in our notes. But you can see here that if there's low blood volume, then the kidneys are thinking, hey, we need more blood flow coming through, or we're not going to be able to filter the blood adequately. We're going to be a sick body. So they release this enzyme called renin. Renin activates a hormone called angiotensin II that does a few different things to increase blood pressure. One of the things it actually does is um, angiotensin II actually stimulates further release of aldosterone. And then the other substance that's released is directly a hormone that you guys have already heard about called EPO. Uh, it stands for erythropoietin. And that just means red production, so basically red blood cell production. So erythropoietin will go to the bone marrow to stimulate red blood cell production.
And hopefully that will be a little bit of an aha for you too because now you're thinking, oh, okay, if we make more red blood cells, then our blood can carry more oxygen. So if these cells are capable of sensing low oxygen as well, then that would help to solve that problem. But just having more red blood cells also increases blood volume, and then that's going to help with the glomerular filtration rate, making sure that enough fluid is constantly uh, being filtered at Bowman's capsule. All right, I think I got in there everything I wanted to on this page. Um, we'll wrap up with, um, do you see at the bottom here these paratubular capillary beds? Well, what they then become are venules and then veins and then eventually go back to the vena cava and rejoin the blood supply. So the blood supply has gone all the way through the kidney and then back out again. Talk to you later.